welcome. You all came back. <laughs> Great. So good to see you again as we're continuing our study in 2 Thessalonians. And I recently read an article in the Stanford News Online about these plants known as, I don't know if it's extremophytes or extremophytes, plants that have developed the capacity to not only survive, but thrive in harsh conditions, which many scientists are interested in as they evaluate how plants respond to climate change. When faced with conditions that are too dry, salty, or cold, the article says, most plants try to conserve resources. They send out fewer leaves and roots and close up their pores to hold in water. If circumstances don't improve, they eventually die. But with extremophytes, it's a different story. The article goes on to say that one type of extremophyte, a member of the mustard family, doesn't just survive in conditions that would kill most plants, it thrives in them. It grows in a country where salt concentrations in the water can be six times higher than in the ocean. And researchers at Stanford University found that the plant actually grows faster under these stressful conditions. Most plants produce a stress hormone that acts like a stop signal for growth. But in this hardy plant, it's a green light. The plant accelerates its growth in response to the stress hormone. As I read this, I couldn't help but think of the Thessalonian church and what we have learned about their perseverance of faith and love in the midst of affliction and persecution. They were thriving in the harshest of circumstances. But how did they do that? And what can we learn from the message they received from the Apostle Paul about how they can find consolation in the just judgment of God. And you're going to hear me use that word a few times this morning, the word consolation. And what I mean by consolation is really the dictionary definition, something that alleviates or lessens grief, discomfort, sorrow, or disappointment, something that brings solace, comfort, and relief. So, to get started, let's remind ourselves of where we left off and where we're headed in the passage we're talking about today, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 12. And as we do so, we're going to talk about the relief, the retribution, the ruling, and the request. So let's turn there now. If you would, with me in your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And to get the complete thought, I'm going to back up and start with verse 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 5. And it says, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling 
and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when we last met, uh, we left things on sort of a a cliffhanger with the Thessalonian church in mid-sentence of verse 5 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we saw that Paul was telling them that their experience of suffering under persecution demonstrated the righteous or just judgment of God. But how? And I should clarify that when we speak of judgment, we're not just talking about handing down a verdict or sentence, but about God's discernment of what is appropriate and right to do in a given circumstance. And with that in mind, first of all, God had judged that it was right to work through this affliction in their lives to shape their characters, to develop them to develop in them a steadfast faith and a love for one another that would not be shaken in times of persecution. And the evidence of this right judgment of God is shown in Paul's commendation of the Thessalonians in the previous verses where he tells them, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is an amazing display of spiritual growth and thriving under the extremely harsh conditions of persecution and affliction. Not only were they simply hanging on in the midst of trials, they were actually growing abundantly, and their love was increasing. God's work in them was causing them to produce the fruit of faithfulness in their lives, and he was preparing them to be the people that he would deem worthy of his kingdom. In a companion passage to this in Philippians 1, 27 to 30, Paul tells the Philippian church, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. And here again, we see the concept of living in a manner that is worthy of the gospel or worthy of the kingdom of God. And that always involves remaining steadfast in faith in times of trial. This same thought is carried in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 where we learn that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, when he talks about this, he talks about in this living hope, in this imperishable inheritance, in this salvation awaiting us, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, 
more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God is telling us through Peter's letter that the trials we encounter test the genuineness of our faith, which is more precious and lasting than gold. So with the Thessalonian church, God was using this testing to show their worthiness of the kingdom. And as they excelled in their steadfastness of faith and love for each other, they would be able to demonstrate that worthiness, that genuine faith, as a witness to the world of the transforming work of the gospel. This is a similar argument to what we see in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 17, when he says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The natural outworking of genuine internal faith is the external evidence of that faith displayed in the life of a Christian. And what is so glorious about this genuine faith is that it leads us to the hope of heaven and an inheritance that can never be taken away. And it leads to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns. God knows that our trials cause us grief. But he says that even in the midst of our grief, we can rejoice because we can be confident that he is doing a good work in us and his power is guarding us in our faith. And we have a future hope that can never be taken away from us. It's a sure thing. Is this helpful to you as you think through your own experiences of suffering? Warren Wearsby said, trials do not make a person, they reveal what a person is made of. And have you noticed how times of testing either bring out the best or the worst in us? It brings out what's going on deep inside of our hearts and our minds. Are we people of such solid faith that trials or suffering or adversity reveals in us a deeper trust in God and love for his people and confidence in his word and in his good character and in his good plans for us? If not, what actions can we take now to work toward building a more solid faith that grows instead of shrinks in times of testing. Perhaps it's a matter of investing more in reading and meditating on God's word or being more intentional in our prayer life. Maybe we need to exchange some of our earthly priorities for God's kingdom priorities so that our focus is on things of eternal significance rather than temporary earthly treasures. What should be our attitude and response when trials do come as we recognize it as a time of testing the genuineness of our faith? And how can the justice of God's discipline in our lives be a consolation to us? Well, now, in addition to this testing of faith, we see that it is a sign of the righteous judgment of God to bring relief to his people. And not only to them, but notice that Paul says, as well as to us. It's like he's saying to the Thessalonians, and even in the passage we discussed from Philippians, I'm right there with you. I am sharing in this experience of persecution and suffering, and I am taking comfort in the knowledge that God will bring relief to us. God saw their suffering, and he cared and still cares about the afflictions faced by his people, and he does want to bring us relief. 
The word for relief here carries with it the idea of the slackening of a bowstring, of a loosening of tension, of relaxation, of easing, of liberty, of rest. Well, we also see evidence of the righteous judgment of God in the punishment of those who have afflicted his people and ultimately in his judgment of those who have rejected him and his gifts of salvation and reconciliation. Let's look back once again at our passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 where it says in verses 6 to 8, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So the relief that is coming to believers is going to come at the revelation of Jesus, but he is also bringing retribution on those who have afflicted his people. This is interesting because it tells us that God takes note of those who have inflicted harm on his people, and he will hold them accountable and punish them. And more broadly, judgment is coming to all those who don't believe in or obey him, to those who have perpetuated wickedness on the earth. Maybe some of you have experienced times of persecution that are similar to what we're reading about, but I have never experienced that kind of persecution. But this is certainly the experience of many of our brothers and sisters in the Lord around the world. And we have access to their stories online and in print from a variety of sources. And while we can be deeply moved with compassion by these stories and moved to prayer, there's something really powerful about going to these places and seeing and hearing firsthand about the persecution faced by Christians in other countries. Last year in the spring, my husband and I had the opportunity to do that. We visited our daughter who was living in Iraq working for a Christian humanitarian relief organization. And as we spent some time in the Christian town where she lived, we saw the bombed out buildings and burned shells of family homes, the desecrated churches, churches that were burned and crumbling with defaced Christian symbols and cemeteries dug up with headstones tossed around like so many dominoes and the church walls riddled with bullets and vandalized by hate-filled graffiti that said, we love death as you love life. Some churches and homes were in the process of repair and others stood abandoned. And as we heard the stories of those who fled for their lives from a group that told them they must either deny Christ or carry the financial burden of paying a special tax or be killed. Many chose to flee, and as they left, their belongings were stolen from them at checkpoints. And the houses that they left behind were looted, and many homes were later burned. And it was heartbreaking to see and heartbreaking to hear. And our hearts cried out for justice for these people who had suffered such terror and loss because they are Christians. Does it encourage us to know that when our hearts cry out to God for justice, there will come a day when justice will be done? It can often feel like evil people have the last word, like they are getting away with it. And maybe some of us get discouraged and think, 
what am I even doing all of this for? These people keep prospering in their evil plans, and I'm facing all of this adversity, and we're not alone. Several of the Psalms address this same feeling. But remember the attitude of Jesus when he faced the extreme injustice of his crucifixion, which we read about in 1 Peter 2.23, where it says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus was fully confident that he would experience the vindicating justice of God, even though he was, in the moment, facing terrible suffering. He continued entrusting himself. That is an ongoing attitude of trust in him who judges justly. Jesus knows exactly what it feels like to be in the midst of suffering and persecution and have to wait for the justice of God to be fully realized at some future time. But he found consolation in the thought that he could completely trust God to carry out his perfect justice in his perfect timing. Is it a consolation for us to know that nothing will escape God's justice, to know that his justice will flood every corner of this earth? Can we find reasons to rejoice now, knowing that God's justice will prevail while we await future joys and the vindication to come? Well, now in thinking about what is to come and returning to our passage, what does it mean when it talks about this time when Jesus will be revealed from heaven? Well, when we studied 1 Thessalonians last year, uh, some of you probably remember that we saw that Paul taught the church about the rapture, that special event just for believers when they will be suddenly caught up to meet Jesus in the air and be with him forever. But that's not the event Paul is talking about here in 2 Thessalonians 1. This time, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, is a reference to the bodily, visible return of Jesus to the earth. And it will take place in addition to the rapture. Remember that in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 11, when the disciples saw Jesus Ascending into heaven after his resurrection, the angels attending this event told the disciples, this Jesus who was taken up from from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And this return by Jesus from heaven will be astonishing, awe-inspiring, terrifying, and visible to everyone. We are told that he will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. This description is confirmation of his deity and shows it will be a time when he will reveal himself to the whole world as the triumphant king who has come to administer the justice of God. The Gospel of Matthew speaks of this time in Matthew 24, 29 to 30, where it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And earlier in that same gospel, it says in Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. 
And now we see from our passage in 2 Thessalonians that the scope of God's judgment widens from the persecutors of the church to all who have rejected him and his gospel. And this is not an act of spiteful revenge, but an appropriate exercise of God's righteous justice carried out by the Son of God according to his holiness and his law against those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these subjects of God's judgment are the ones we read about in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 21, where it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So because of this, Jesus will return to bring retribution to the ungodly, and he will also deliver his ruling or sentence to all people, which will depend on their standing with him. And what will be this ruling? Well, let's look back at our passage again in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10, where we read, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Well, here we have two different sets of people experiencing the justice of God. One group made up of those who have rejected Christ, and the other group made up of those who have been justified or declared not guilty through Christ. And the contrast could not be more striking. The first group, those who do not know God and who do not obey his gospel, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. This is not a reference to their total annihilation, but a conscious state of utter ruin for eternity. And not only that, but they will be removed from God's presence and glory forever. This is a terrifying truth that we cannot simply pass over on our way to happier things. As Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Speaking of this group in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians, John MacArthur says, the lost, that is those who reject God and the gospel, will not cease to exist, but will experience forever a life of uselessness, hopelessness, emptiness, and meaninglessness with no value, worth, accomplishment, purpose, goal, or hope. They will be ruined forever, cut off from the visible display of God's splendor and majesty. Nothing of God's glorious presence to bring any shred of beauty, pleasure, joy, or peace. Let's just stop and let that sink in. The second group, the saints who have believed, meaning they do know God and do obey his gospel, they will bring glory to Christ and will be filled with wonder at the sight of him. 
And Paul makes sure that the Thessalonian church members know that they will be included in this group because, as he says, our testimony to you was believed. The Thessalonians believed the word of God in the message of the gospel and have given evidence of their belief by their faithfulness and their love. And they have joined the ranks of all believers who will be with the Lord in glory forever. It's amazing to see that the justice of God involves not only punishment of the persecutors and the ungodly, but also the reward of those who have placed their faith in Jesus to save them from their sins. It is so wonderful that we have the consolation of knowing that we have been justified in God's sight through the saving work of Jesus on our behalf. His justice has resulted in our deliverance from eternal destruction. And it is a consolation to know that God's justice will ultimately triumph in the world. But we also need to have a healthy respect for the judgment of God on the ungodly and not an arrogant sense of vengeance when we consider that all of us were heading in the same direction toward hell until God saved us. None of us are deserving or worthy of his grace, and we should feel a sense of fear and trembling at the fate awaiting those who don't know God and reject his gospel. God is righteous and holy, and he must punish sin. But for those who are saved, he has punished it in Jesus Christ, who bore God's wrath on our behalf. But for those who reject Christ, they will bear the wrath of God for their sin upon themselves. Do we have a heart to see those who are lost come to Christ? Do we pray for the people in our lives who don't know Christ to come to faith in him? Do we take every opportunity to point the way to him so that others will know the truth, so they can know the consolation of God's justice, a justice that can deliver them from an eternity separated from him? Finally, although Paul commends the Thessalonians for their steadfastness, the ability of the church to remain faithful, and the same goes for us as believers today, is really an act of God. God is the one who enabled the church to grow in faithfulness, even as they were doing the hard work of striving to grow in faith and love in the midst of suffering. If we return again to Paul's letter to the Philippian church, he talks about this process in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, where he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure." So we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, and yet it is God who works in us so that we have the desire and the ability to live to please him. And in his letter to the Colossians, Paul says of his ministry in Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, him we proclaim, Paul is talking about Jesus, him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul describes himself as toiling and struggling, but all the while it is the energy of Christ that is powerfully at work within him. 
this is a mysterious process, this cooperation of ours with God to do a work within us. And Paul understood this unique partnership between believers and God, and so that is why he prays for the Thessalonians. They and we are totally reliant on God, while at the same time responsible to do our part in giving ourselves over to this process. Just what does Paul specifically pray for the church? Well, let's read that again. Let's see his request in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 11 to 12, where it says, To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The phrase, to this end, refers back to what Paul has been talking about as the Thessalonian church awaited the day when the justice of God would reign and believers would experience the glorious presence of the Lord Jesus, this is what he prayed. First, Paul prayed that God would make them worthy of their calling. That is, that God will complete the work he started in them of sanctification, of making them like Jesus when he first called them out of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, as it says in Colossians 1.13. Secondly, Paul prayed that God would fulfill every resolve to do good. That is their determination to act with goodness as defined according to what God calls good. Thirdly, Paul prayed that God would fulfill every work of faith by his power, which brings to mind Ephesians 2.10, where we are told as believers, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And last, Paul prayed that the name of the Lord Jesus would be glorified in them and they in him, meaning that the witness of this church as the world sees the transforming work of God in them would bring honor and praise to the name of Jesus, and the church members themselves would be glorified or receive honor because of their association with him. I like the way Leon Morris defines the glory of God in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians. He says, the glory of God is the visible manifestation of the greatness of God. The visible manifestation of the greatness of God. That is our ultimate purpose, to shine a spotlight on the greatness of God. And how is all of this accomplished? It is by the power and the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. On a side note, by the way, this is one of those prayers in the Bible that are a great model for us in how we can pray for ourselves and other believers because it is a prayer of faith that shows an utter dependence on the work and power of God while making the purposes of God a priority in our lives. Well, even though the relief and the vindication we long for is, for the most part, something that we await in the future, what do we have to sustain us and give us comfort now in the meantime? We have the assurance that we can trust God to continue and to complete his work of sanctification in us. 
as we cooperate with his Holy Spirit in this process for our benefit and for the glory of God. And we have the consolation of knowing that God's justice will be fulfilled and that we too will be able to not only survive, but thrive in the hostile environment of this world because we have the hope of heaven and the help of God who enables us by his power and grace to grow in faith and love until Jesus returns. Let's pray. Oh God, we do cry out for justice and we long to see the day when you will bring it. But I pray that we would be strengthened by the hope that we have in you, that you will continue the good work you are doing and that we will see that day when your justice will reign. Thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing to us that you do care. You do understand our griefs. You will bring us relief. And so, Lord, we want to be people who will thrive even in the midst of persecution and affliction that we would show forth our worthiness to be part of your kingdom, that we would show forth the great work that you're doing, that we would shine a spotlight on your greatness. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.